If you like this series, check out the Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong merchandise available in the NSI store to support us making more episodes. We're at FMNH, the Field Museum in Chicago. We're going to talk about dinosaurs. We usually talk on this show about the gap between paleontological knowledge and what toy makers are willing to put into their models. Even museums who are aware of the formative role that they play in humans' perceptions of these extinct animals are victims of the march of progress. As science finds out new things, mounts become outdated. So we're going to talk about that. We're here with the Brachiosaurus cast of the holotype, which was actually recovered by a field museum worker, Riggs, uh, and his preparator, Menke, in 1900, described 1903, erected as a skeleton in, I think, 1993. It was the skeleton that was in the main hall when I was a kid. Heinrich Mallison actually pointed out that the pectoral girdle, the shoulder girdle, is too high. It looks like it's choking the animal. So really, there should be room for the air passages and the throat to pass through into the chest cavity, which means that the coracoids should be down under the creature a little bit more, which would elevate the torso a little bit more, and it would even make the animal higher. So what's not to like about that? The only other major shift in Brachiosaurus that we've had since this was built is the separation out of Giraffa Titan. The holotype of Brachiosaurus was pretty incomplete. It didn't have a head, so that's been filled in based on Jan Ench's skeleton, which is now classified as Jurassic Titan. We are not 100% sure that Brachiosaurus should have a Giraffe Titan looking head. It might be a more intermediary form between Camrosaurus and Giraffe Titan. But to talk about that, we need to go inside. So in the case behind me are three skulls, all of which are relevant to Brachiosaurus because, and to Apatosaurus actually, because in the 1880s, before we even knew what a Brachiosaurus was, somebody sent what we now think was a Brachiosaurus skull to Marsh, who then thought, okay, put this on Brontosaurus. And he and Osborne, even though another researcher named Malon in 1915 thought, no, Apatosaurus should have a diplodocid-looking skull, uh, sort of bullied him into not restoring it that way. And it wasn't until the 70s that we really had the idea of, oh, diplodocids had diplodocid skulls, macronarians had macronarian skulls. The case behind me has both a diplodocid skull, it has a Camrosaurus, and it has a Brachiosaurus altothorax. Now, the skull in question, the Felch quarry skull, is unique because it's sort of intermediary between the Camrosaurus condition and the Giraffe Titan more dramatic, scooped look that we all think of when we think of Brachiosaurus. So it's possible that in the future we might see Brachiosaurus restored with that skull instead. Not that that particularly matters for the replica outside, because, I mean, it's way up there. Nobody's going to notice a different nose on it. This is an Apatosaurus, which famously, in 2015, Shop et al. separated into Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus. So you would think this would be labeled Brontosaurus now, because if you look at its vertebrae, it has very Brontosaurus-y looking neural spines. But that same paper, moved this exact specimen outside of the Apatosaurines, maybe. It might be a close relative of Brontosaurus, but we can't say that it's a congeneric with Brontosaurus unless uh, Amphicelius is also a Brontosaurus. So that's a little bit of everything's up in the air right now that you probably can't put on like a nameplate for a specimen, but it's exciting nonetheless. And we have our main event, which is Maximo, the Pataga Titan from Argentina. This was just described last year by Carvalho and eight co-authors. 
So it's essentially cutting edge as far as dinosaur skeleton mounts go, but there are a lot of things that a mounted skeleton will communicate way more effectively than diagrams in a paper, which you can read, by the way. So I'm just going to run through some of those. This is obviously a cast because you can walk under it and touch it and things, which just by itself, being able to physically touch a mount is it's something you don't get from a book, obviously. You, it, it's a different way of experiencing an animal. It's funny that it uh, replaced the Brachiosaurus because Titanosaurs in the mid-Cretaceous, which is when this lived, replaced Brachiosaurus and Diplodocids in their ecological niche. So it's, it's almost ironic. You can kind of tell which bones in the replica came out of the ground because those are the ones that have like cracks and repaired points on them, whereas the ones that are sculpted are a little smoother. But it all looks really consistent. We have a lot of this animal. They found uh, at minimum six individuals and we have a lot of the animal. The only major portions we're missing are the head, the hands, and the feet. So those have been filled in from other related animals. Speaking of the hands, this is what I mean when I say that sauropod manus is, is sort of a fleshy semicircle or hoof-like arrangement. And it's much clearer seeing that in person compared to trying to show you, like, this is the front view and this is the down view. This is a lonchosaur from South America. They are a subgroup of the titanosaurs, so named because they are long. That was a joke. Lonco uh, is Mapuche for chief, so these are the chief lizards, which makes sense because Patagotitan, Puertosaurus, and Argentinosaurus are all almost tied for largest known land animal ever. So it, it, it's appropriate that we would call them the chief reptiles. You can tell it's a lonchosaur if you look at the neural spines on the middle of the, the cervicals. You can see the loops that attach the cervical ribs are distinctive for lonchosaurs. The cervical ribs themselves, look at those things. They're like as long as me. We talked about this with uh, Giraffe Titan, but the idea with the cervical ribs is that they allow the animal's muscles to be further back on the neck so that it doesn't have all of this mass towards the head. It's sort of like the arrangement that we have in birds, except with birds, they just stay as fleshy tendons, whereas these are ossified tendons. So you can have a decent amount of strength while still being enormous. Another place that the skeleton was strengthened is between the third and the fourth dorsal vertebrae, which is hard to see in the picture in the paper, but you can see it here because it's not blocked by the scapula. <laughs> There's an extra process on the back of the vertebrae. So instead of just articulating between the two centra and between the articular process, it's also got that extra joint, which the researchers think is because it's just such an enormous animal, having the shoulders transferring that weight up into the spine, it needed extra reinforcement. So it's a little bit like what's happening with the sacrum, which is large enough that you could plausibly use it as a rowboat or something. But just like the sacrum strengthens the spine over the hip, that reinforced joint between dorsals three and four reinforces the spine over the shoulders. This guy has gotten a lot of press for being the largest dinosaur ever found. It's kind of tied, as I implied. Argentinosaurus and Puertosaurus are both about the same size, but they're way less completely known. So until we find more material from those animals, we won't necessarily be able to pick a winner. Matt Weddle has pointed out that if you look at the circumference of the largest uh, vertebra centra, it's one centimeter larger in Argentinosaurus. And if you look at the circumference of the humerus, uh, it's larger in Argentinosaurus as well. So maybe Argentinosaurus was heavier because the parts of it that are load-bearing are more robust, but uh, for now, I think we're, we're safe calling it largest. So as tall as I am, I have to reach over my head to, to reach this guy's knee. It was funny, the initial buzz around uh, Patagotitan 
before it was even named, uh, was that Pablo Puerta was posing next to a femur from this guy lying on the ground and standing next to it. Like, I'm taller than him, I think, and this femur still dwarfs me. That's another interesting link with Brachiosaurus, because the Brachiosaurus that's outside, and also in storage here, has a photograph of Menke, the preparator that recovered it, posing lying alongside its humerus, which is also dwarfing him. So we've, it's been a hundred years and we're, we're still engaging the public the same way by lying humans next to enormous fossil bones. As it happens, during our visit, they have a temporary exhibit up about Antarctic uh, uh, fossil expedition that they did. And part of it is this Cryolophosaurus, as well as a model of it. Cryolophosaurus is exciting because we don't, it, first off, it's exciting just that people went to Antarctica and came back with fossils instead of corpses. Uh, I guess they did technically come back with corpses, just really, really old ones. Point is, Cryolophosaurus previously was restored as essentially a tiny Allosaurus uh, uh, with a fancy crest on its head. Totally different now. It's a basal tetanurin, so it's much more of a Dilophosaurus-looking head on it now. The, the skull was lacking the most of the permaxilla, some of the dentary, just we didn't have, we didn't know what the front of its snout looked like at first. So sometimes you'll see it restored with a really squat face, like some kind of abelosaurid. Sometimes you'll see it more like an allosaurus. Currently, with its phylogenetic position, having the notch in the front, much like Dilophosaurus, uh, is most reasonable. And it gives the skull that really nice elongated snout on it. Overall, the skeleton is a lot more like a primitive theropod. It's got smaller limbs than you would maybe expect for such a long body, but that's exactly what you see in dinosaurs at this phylogenetic position. That said, even with relatively small arms, look at the size of the shoulder blade. It's just way bigger than an animal this size I would expect to see. They found little basal sauropodomorphs. These don't even have a scientific name yet, but uh, I think this is a juvenile. It might, it might be grown. They, basal sauropodomorphs are weird. They have a lot of variation in size, but you can see all of the, the sauropod characteristics just in their much more basal form. All, uh, it's, it's much closer to where theropods and sauropodomorphs diverged, or maybe where ornithoscoledons and sauropodomorphs diverged. Look at those teeth! They're so little, yet so clearly basal sauropod teeth. This is a cool exhibit. It's weird to say that a skeleton is cute, but this skeleton is cute. So, Sue is actually being moved at the moment to make room for Maximo, the Patagotitan, but also the museum is taking this opportunity to update their mount. When Sue was put up, they didn't exactly know how the gastralia, the belly ribs, should be incorporated into the mount, but now they're in there and it is a way different look than uh, uh, originally. It, it's weird how deep Tyrannosaurus's chest is. Now, if I had to criticize it, I would say that the pose with the legs sort of crouched like that isn't, isn't selling Tyrannosaurus very well because it, for one thing, it almost looks like the belly's gonna scrape on the ground, but also, you know, Tyrannosaurus was the, the leggy strider of the Cretaceous and this looks more like they're stalking something. I notice they also replaced the wishbone, the furcula. They had a bone in there that was longer than what it actually was. They also, in the process of doing that, moved the coracoids closer together, and it looks like they're more vertically oriented on the chest as well, which means that the arms are actually sticking out a little bit more, which kind of makes sense. They, in their previous position, they wouldn't have been terribly useful, whereas now they're actually in a position where they can interact with things in front of the animal. Although I notice if they were to stand the animal up more, they might actually be like scraping their head on the ceiling, which might not work either. I do like the space now. Uh, when Sue was in the main hall, uh, they looked a little bit dinky. So even though science is marching on, the Field Museum and museums in general are keeping pace. I want to thank the Field Museum for allowing us to film here. 
I want to encourage all of you to come and check out this impressive place. I encourage you to also check out the NSI.org to see how you can get involved with our Science Institute. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you next time.